What is e to the pi times i? This is one of my favorite things to ask students who have just learned what e is because they know what all those are, but at the same time this is really hard to guess because it should be just some really random number. But as many of you probably know, the answer is negative 1, which is very odd because it's such a normal number. Now some mathematicians call this the most beautiful equation in all of mathematics, and there's even been books written about it. For those who need a little background, this is saying that e, an infinitely long non-repeating decimal that has to do with continuous compounding interest, raised to the power of pi, which has to do with circles, times i, or the square root of negative 1, which is known as an imaginary number, is negative 1. Now this expression itself does not apply to the real world so much, but Euler's formula, which is where this expression comes from, does. In high school, we learned that i is the square root of negative 1, and i squared is therefore negative 1. And then this cycles in patterns of four expressions that you see here. You might learn a few other concepts, but overall it's pretty dry, and with a name like imaginary numbers, it begs the question, who even cares? Well, once I got to college level courses, I saw how yes, these actually have real world applications in physics and engineering, as well as math and other sciences. Imaginary numbers help us model how electric circuits behave, how electromagnetic waves travel through air and space, which is what allows us to listen to the radio, talk on the phone, and so on. They help us model fluid flow, and also the physics of the quantum world. In engineering, they show up a lot specifically in signal analysis and control theory as well. Now those are a lot of the main applications actually, but I want you to know how and why this works, and then I'll show more examples. As an electrical engineer, once I got to my second circuit analysis class in college, we took a break from all engineering work and really focused on the math behind imaginary numbers. And that was so we were ready to use them to analyze circuits and signals in the weeks and classes to come. The beginning of that was Euler's formula, so let's see where that comes from. What I'm about to show is Calculus 2 information that anyone with some Algebra 2 or pre-calc knowledge should be able to follow. So let's pull up Desmos and we're going to graph sine of x. If you haven't seen this before, well, now you have. Then on top of that, we're going to graph the line just y equals x. Now, are these graphs the same? Of course not, but they do have some similarities. For one, they cross right at the origin. They share a point right here. And the line y equals x is also tangent to, to y equals sine of x. For those who don't know what that term is yet, don't even worry about it. Now what I'm going to do is add another term to this x, and it's going to be minus x to the third over 3 factorial. Now what do we see? These graphs are again not the same, but they're definitely more closely related. For those who have taken calculus, this blue curve here has the same point at x equals 0 as sine of x, but also the same first, second, and third derivative of sine of x at x equals 0. Now let's add another term of x to the fifth divided by 5 factorial. And again, what you'll notice is these aren't the same, but they are a little more closely related in terms of looks. If we keep writing out more and more terms using that same pattern, this equation becomes identical to sine of x. So as you can see, the blue curve is looking very, very similar to our graph of sine of x, at least up to a certain point. At large values of x, yes, it does deviate a lot, but zoom in and they look almost the exact same. This equation you see here, if you keep writing out more and more terms, is again identical to sine of x, and it's known as the Maclaurin series of sine of x. If you plug in a number for x here, and one for x in all these other terms, you'll get the same number on both sides, at least if you do the infinite sum. Then we can do the same thing for cosine of x. The Maclaurin series looks similar, but this one starts with y equals 1, then we're going to add a minus x to the second over 2 factorial term, then plus x to the fourth over four factorial, and the pattern just continues. Right now I'm just showing that these Maclaurin series actually match the respective graphs. I honestly could just show the equations, but I think it's better to see it graphically. Then the last thing we're going to do is e to the x. This Maclaurin series starts with one, and then we add an x, then x to the second over two factorial, and again that pattern just continues. Okay, so now we have three of our key functions in all their Maclaurin series, which remember, if you plug in anything for x here, and that same thing for all these other x's, the two sides will be equal. Now instead of e to the x, we're going to do e to the ix. That will equal that same Maclaurin series, but with all the x's replaced with ix. 
You guys see how every i is to some integer exponent? Well, using that pattern of i to some power from before, we can make the equation look like this. I won't show how it gets to this, but it's not too bad if you want to try it on your own. Now, do you notice anything? This right here is cosine x. It's the Maclaurin series from above. And this is sine of x, which is multiplied by i. And thus we have e to the i x equals cosine of x plus i times sine of x, which is Euler's formula I showed before. And hey, if you put in pi for x here, here, and here, you get e to the pi times i equals cosine of pi plus i times sine of pi. Cosine of pi is negative 1. Sine of pi is 0, so that just goes away. And we get that identity from before. So now you know where that comes from. And there's an overview of a proof for Euler's formula, but now why would we actually need to use this? This next example is going to be pretty much word for word identical to what I've done before, so if you have seen it, just skip to this part of the video. So to put simply, the basics of why complex numbers are important is phase, as in the phase of a trig function. The only difference between these two functions is their phase, or basically a left or right shift when looking at a graph. Now if you've taken any trig, you may be thinking, wait, I've done phase before and it does not require using imaginary numbers. The phase just tells you how offset the graph will be, which is correct. But what happens when you want to add two trig functions of different phases? Now complex numbers come in. But the question is why? Well, let's put up Euler's formula again. Now let's plug in something like t plus 15 for x. Then we have e to the i times t plus 15 degrees equals cosine of those same terms plus i times sine of those same terms. So look at that. The real part of this is just this, a normal looking cosine function with some phase offset. Now if we want to add that to another cosine function with the same frequency but different phase, then we can just rewrite that using Euler's formula, and the part we want to add is again also the real part. So essentially if you add these up here and take the real part of it, you would find what these two added up are, which is what I said we wanted to do. So if I just rewrite this as adding the exponential parts you see on the left, what I can do is distribute the i to both of the terms. Then we have an exponent with two separate terms separated by addition. Meaning if you remember your rules of exponents, you can separate that into multiplication, each with e as the base and the two separate components in each of the exponents. You can do that for the other one as well. And since they both have an e to the i t here, you can factor that out and the inside is something you can solve using Euler's formula but just plugging in numbers now. e to the i times 15 is cosine of 15 plus i times sine of 15 or 0.966 plus i times 0.259. It's just Euler's formula with an actual number now, and we can do that with a calculator. Then e to the 50i is about 0.643 plus i times 0.766. Add those up and we get 1.069 plus 1.025i. Now I'm not going to show how I get this next part, but I can turn this back into an exponential, which is 1.908e to the 32.5i. If you don't believe this, just use Euler's formula again and you'll see you can go from this to this. Okay, let's take a sec to just review where we are for those who are lost. The original question was what does this simplify to? That's it, that's all we are doing right now. Try and turn this into one term. Then using Euler's formula we show that the original question is the same as the real part of this. So that's what we really want, just the real part. The part that does not have an i multiplied by it. If that can be expressed as one term, we'll have our answer. Then this last part was just solving for the e to the 50i plus e to the 15i, so we can get a simplified answer there. Now that we have it, we can throw it in right here. Now I have two exponentials multiplied, so I get 1.908 times e to the i t plus 32.5i, since I'm allowed to add exponents like that. Then I can factor out an i, and I get this expression. Now that we have this, we can again use Euler's formula and turn it into a cosine and sine function. And finally, remember how we said once we add up everything, the real part of our answer will be the solution? Well, that real part is 1.908 cosine of t plus 32.5. And now we know that the original question simplifies to this one cosine equation. These are the exact same thing. Now one of the most well-known applications of all this is for AC circuits, or circuits with an alternating current. This is where I really applied complex numbers for the first time. For example, if two voltages with different phases are put into a circuit, you need to combine them into one before doing analysis, which you now know the basics of. 
Whenever we were given a sinusoidal voltage of some amplitude and phase, we always had to change that to exponential form with the amplitude in front and the angle up top multiplied by i. We did not need to include the time variable to do the math here actually, but we usually wrote it in this notation instead to just focus on the amplitude and phase. But that's nothing to worry about though. Then we learned how throwing in a capacitor or inductor to a circuit will shift the voltage and current depending on their values. The math to represent that is all complex numbers. Inductors and capacitors have something called impedance, sort of like resistance for a resistor, but impedance also tells us how the voltage and current will be shifted, not just reduced. An inductor might have an impedance of 10i. Yes, it is represented by an imaginary number, and you'll see why. 10i is the same as 10e to the i times 90 degrees. If you don't see how this is true, just use Euler's formula, which I'll put here if you just want to pause the video. To find current in a circuit, you just do voltage over impedance. You'd write both of those in exponential form where the voltage has an amplitude of 20 and a phase offset of 30 degrees in this case. And then we of course know the inductor's impedance which goes down here. Then you solve this with some basic algebra and subtract the exponents to get negative 60 degrees up top, then simply divide the coefficients to get two in front. You can then turn this into its real component, which is all we cared about, and we have the current in this way too simplistic circuit is two cosine of t minus 60 degrees, which yes, is a different phase compared to the input voltage, and that's why we use imaginary numbers to determine shifts in these circuits. Before I show a few more applications, hopefully you're seeing something. Nothing in the real world is really quantified by imaginary numbers. What I mean by that is there's not 5i amps of current flowing through your electronics. It's all real numbers, like 10 amps, 2 volts, and all that. But these complex numbers simply make the math work to manipulate equations and simplify the process as we need. That's it. You cannot physically hold or measure i of anything. Moving on to some more applications, one topic I've talked about many times is the Fourier transform, which basically says any function can be made up of a bunch of sine and cosine functions added up. This is the main thing I learned about in my first signals class, because when looking at a messy signal, if you can break it up into the frequencies that make it up, aka the frequencies of those cosine and sine functions, you can do much more to analyze it and manipulate it for the purposes of audio processing, speech recognition, radar, etc. And the equation for the Fourier transform can be shown here, and in it you'll see an imaginary number, as well as something that looks very similar to that e to the ix we've been seeing. Now, as sort of a random example that I'm going to tie to physics, let's say we have a function that is very narrow with this one spike. The Fourier transform of this would be mostly a sinusoidal function, but don't even worry about how or why. For those who know the Dirac delta function, that's really what I'm going for while avoiding having to explain it. Now, in quantum mechanics, as you may know from my physics video, you cannot know the position and velocity of a particle at the same time. There's uncertainty to it. The more you know about one, the less you know about the other. Well, mathematically, this graph might represent a wave function describing the position of a particle. It's localized and shows that we have a very well-defined position here. Not much uncertainty. The Fourier transform is a non-localized function oscillating up and down, which reveals a velocity or really momentum that is not well-defined. I can accurately determine one thing and therefore am uncertain about the other. And now you know a little about the math behind that as well, although this is way oversimplified. If you watch the MIT lectures on quantum mechanics, you would see imaginary numbers come up in lectures 3 and 4 and 5, 6, 7, and you get the idea. It's everywhere in quantum mechanics. And like I said, imaginary numbers come up a good amount in control theory, which is big for mechanical, aerospace, or electrical engineers, and mechatronics majors, just to name a few. For example, these are two graphs taken from my controls class textbook. You see that J right here labeling the y-axis? That's just I, the imaginary unit. Electrical engineers use J instead of I because I is typically used for current. On this plot, they actually label the imaginary axis, though. These x's and zeros and where they're located on the real and imaginary axes tell us things like the stability of the system, for example, and how certain parameters change with respect to individual components of the control system. These control systems are found in rockets, fighter jets, robots, autonomous vehicles, and more, but I'm not going to go into any more technical detail than that. And before I end this video, I just want to note that you don't need imaginary numbers for these real-world applications. They just help make things simpler. Leonard Euler, who was alive during the 1700s, made a lot of progress on our understanding of complex numbers. 
and it was in 1892 when a man named Charles Steinmetz joined General Electric and soon after published a paper showing how to use imaginary numbers to greatly simplify the analysis of AC circuits. You can run other equations that will spit out the exact same solutions, but the use of these complex numbers simplifies the process a lot, and this is said to have accelerated the pace of innovation during the 20th century. And using just what I showed in this video, you can prove some very weird things like the cosine of i is about 1.54 and i to the i is about 0.208, which I'll leave for you to try if you want to challenge yourself. But all you need is Euler's formula to prove both of those. There are more applications of course, but due to time I'm not going to go into them. Again, in college you can definitely expect to see a lot of this if you go into electrical engineering or even computer engineering as they share a lot of the same classes. Although other majors like aerospace engineers, mechanical engineers, biomedical engineers, and several more have to take a basic circuits class in which they'll learn a lot of the basics of this as well. Then most math majors as well as some physics majors and some electrical engineers will have to take a class on complex analysis in college which is all about complex numbers and the math behind them. I took this class in college and loved it, although we did not really go into any of the applications. It was really more of a pure math class that does have applications which we did not go into in the course itself. Now before I end this video, I think it's my responsibility to say don't let any of this scare you if you're going into any of these majors. I was very hesitant to make the video as technical as I did, but I really enjoy this stuff and wanted you guys to see exactly how it works. As I said before, I definitely am a math person, but I remember learning this stuff in college and it taking a little bit of time to get used to, to just understand how these complex numbers applied to the things we were doing in our engineering classes. But after a little bit of practice, you definitely will get the hang of it. And that's it for this video. If you enjoyed, be sure to like and subscribe. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter and join the Major Prep Facebook group for updates on everything, and I'll see you all in the next video.